In today's video, we're going to get two pieces of essentially worthless scrap steel and turn them into this, which is a base plate clamping system that goes underneath essentially any improvised workbench out there in the field and allows us to mount this vise with comparative ease. This vise is made of ductile iron, like nodular iron, and yet it only costs less than a hundred bucks. So that's outstanding value. Anyway, this is a nice simple project for the home DIYer who wants to learn basic skills, you know, drilling, welding, fabricating, things of that nature. And it's certainly not gonna break the bank. Got these two bits of 50 by 12 flat bar that were just bits of scrap lying around and I've cut them and radiused them and cleaned them up where I'm going to weld them and I've beveled the joint. You can see it's nice and shiny and it's going to fit together and make this 90 degree bracket. And the purpose of the 90 degree bracket is we're going to drill and tap it so that I can get this vise, stick it on there and there'll be a bench top in between the vise and the bracket and it's going to act like a clamp and I'm not going to have to dick around with nuts and washers underneath it's just going to go straight on because it's going to be drilled and tapped and also it's not going to over compress the edge of the bench because the nut and the washer are not just going to be too small and just suck themselves up into the wood and destroy it and I've got these M10 by 1.5 the standard metric thread socket head cap screw there's about an inch and a half or 38 millimeters of bench top and I've got a washer to go on top of the vise and it's just going to screw straight down into the bracket when we get it made if you don't speak threads the cap screw thing is just a round head that takes an allen key. In the case of M10, it's always an 8mm allen key. And the 1.5 just tells you that it's 1.5mm between adjacent peaks or troughs on the thread profile. Anyway, it's the standard metric 10mm coarse thread profile. Easy to get taps for and dead easy to drill too, I'd have to say, because if you've got a standard drill index that goes up in half millimeter increments. Conveniently enough, the tapping size for the tap drill size for M10 by 1.5 is 8.5. So that's a standard drill. And M6 is the same because it's a five millimeter drill for M6, M6 by one. Now, if you want to use M8 or M12, you need to buy yourself a special drill. In the case of M8, you need to buy a 6.8 millimeter drill. In the case of M12, you buy 1.75. You need to buy a 10.2 millimeter drill, and that tends to get a little bit specialized and inconvenient, like you have to go on the hunt for that. I have partnered with Vivor for these DIY interludes, right? This is a Vivor welder, this is a Vivor vise, and Let's talk about the welder first. It's called a MIG 270. It's going to cost you, I forget, three something. It's in the ballpark of under 400 bucks. And to me, this is pretty good value because it'll do stick welding and it'll do MIG welding and it'll do DC TIG. Okay, the difference being DC TIG is good for steel, whereas if you want to TIG weld aluminium, you're gonna need AC TIG, which is a fairly specialized thing, okay, or more specialized than this machine will deliver. But jumping to aluminium if you're already a novice welder is kind of a big jump, so <laughs> let's not do that. The MIG readiness of this machine means straight out of the box, it's ready for gasless MIG, which is also called flux core arc welding or FCAW. If you wanna do gas shielded MIG welding, or GMAW for gas metal arc welding in the trade. You're going to need a gas bottle, obviously, and you'll also need to source a regulator because this machine does not come with that. It comes with a TIG torch, though, which is pretty special. Most multi purpose machines have a TIG torch as an accessory, so you're kind of ready for TIG, although you'll need to supply your own tungstens if you go that way, and you'll need another gas bottle because lay down Mazair, the Argo Shield Light or CO2 argon oxygen mixture that you use for MIG welding 
is not going to be suitable for TIG. You'll need straight argon for that. So gearing up for the other processes gets kind of expensive, whereas if you just want to stick initially to flux cord arc welding for like gasless MIG for thin stuff like sheet metal, and if you want to stick with stick welding for this thicker stuff, then you're really ready to rip out of the box with a machine like this for under 400 bucks that's great value right because if you buy a roughly equivalent welder from unimig or boss weld it's going to cost you north of a thousand bucks like well north of a thousand bucks for the same kind of capability and if you're absolutely sure that you want to do welding and it's going to be a thing that you do for the next five to ten years then great but 1500 bucks plus gas bottles, plus this, plus that, that tends to be a bit expensive if you're just dipping your toe in the water. And this machine will keep you going for a couple of years for sure. I've used this quite a bit and been pretty impressed with how it performs. So there's that. The device is kind of interesting too to me because A, it's under a hundred bucks and it seems like a pretty good vice for that price. Meaning it's a six inch jaw with roughly 90 millimeters of throat depth this way and it opens up to about 175. And it comes with these soft jaws as well. They're magnetic so they just stick on if you want to protect what you're working on. And that's kind of important sometimes because the jaws are hardened steel and they do tend to be quite aggressive. Often that doesn't matter when you're just clamping up something like this to bevel it. But sometimes if you're working on something with a decent surface finish and you don't want to mar it, soft jaws are a real bonus. Anyway, it comes with that. It's made of a thing called ductile iron. And I know all cast iron looks the same, but it's really not. Grey cast iron or brittle sort of cast iron is what they make fry pans for camping and drainage grates and things of that nature out of and it tends to be very brittle. This is not that. This is much more amenable to the slings and arrows of the kinds of abuse that you would deliver in a workshop. And hey, I'm sure you can break it, but I'm sure you can break anything. It's also got a little anvil. It's about 70 mil by 70 mil. So if you want to straighten a few things, bent washers and bent nails and things of that nature, it'd be good for that. It's not the same thing as a blacksmith's anvil. I'm sure if you give it a really good hit you'll mar it to buggery because cast iron's pretty soft and also probably if you overdo it you'll break the housing but otherwise it's a swivel vise so you know you can unlock these little toggles here which I hate on all swivel base vices and which I'm going to replace with these M10 by 1.5 socket head cap screws for commonality because then you just need one allen key dude and you can do it all. And you don't have to keep sliding the uh, little lever one way or the other every half a friggin' turn. I don't know why vices have retained this sort of archaic throwback to the past, but they're all like that. It's so easy to improve it with just two socket head cap screws. You're kind of off to the races. If you really do want to give a vice a good red hot hiding frequently, okay? Don't buy a cast iron vice at all. Or buy a cast iron vice for doing work with mechanical sympathy and buy a fabricated steel vice, like a vice that's been welded from steel plate for the real hardcore abuse, right? Because that'll be much more tolerant. One of the things I'd say about cast iron, though, is if you're not going to give it a real big hit, it is extremely good at absorbing vibration and being really inert. It's good at that. I'm going to disassemble the vise real quick and then I'm going to set up the mounting ring at its base on the bracket and I'm only going to care about one hole. I've got a three millimeter drill here that I'm just going to use as like a gauge pin to give me the offset that I want for just this one hole. And the reason I'm doing one hole here is because that's going to be a pain in the ass to drill later when the bracket's welded. And you've always got to think about the order of operations for these fabrication jobs. Because counterintuitively, sometimes it's better just to drill one hole before you weld, then weld the other bits together, and then drill the other two holes. Because then you're going to have a drilled and tapped hole here that you can use to basically clamp this piece together while you lay out the other two holes and then you can just 
unclamp it and take it back to the drill press and drill the other two and there's going to be no doubt that they're going to fit the bracket every time. I'm going to reach for my trusty transfer punch so that I can get the layout of the hole absolutely bang on. Like dude, forget about reaching into a hole with any kind of marker or a pencil or anything of that nature. It's just such an amateur way to do this. It's always going to be wrong. And if you're a quarter of a hole out when you've got to get three holes lined up, that's kind of okay in wood, like you can drift it across later, I guess. But in steel, it's a freaking disaster. So just get yourself a cheap set of transfer punches. They've got a little tiny concentric prick on the end and it just locates concentrically in the hole, goes in beautiful, you'll get the hole absolutely bang on. And then you just give it a little tap just to, just to make the slightest mark on the metal. I mean, it's hardened, so you're not gonna flatten it out. It's quite a durable thing, but you don't need to belt it. It's not the purpose of a transfer punch. The best thing to really drive the point home is a big fat center punch. And even if you're half blind like me, you can feel it. It's just there, that's the right spot. And I think we're good to go now. And uh, that means I'll see you over there at the drill press with an eight and a half millimeter drill and we'll get this thing ready for tapping. With the drilling, I am using my drill press, but hey, only because I've got one and it's an easy way to ensure the holes are at 90 degrees to the surface. But you could do it yourself just with a battery drill and something for alignment like a one, two, three block. What I'm doing here is drilling a four millimeter pilot hole followed by the 8.5 millimeter finished tap drill size. The drill's staying at 660 RPM for both, but that's just because that's where it was. I could definitely drill a four millimeter hole quicker than that. It'd be ideal at about 1200 RPM, I suppose. But then you'd have to change the speeds and knock it back a bit for eight and a half. And when you think about the return on investment for all the time and stuffing around, changing the belts over, blah, blah, blah. I just leave it on about 660 and get through both of them. It only takes a couple of minutes. And then back at the bench, the first thing I do is countersink both of the holes. That's going to be nicer to touch for the remainder of eternity, just with the sharp edges broken over like that. But it also gives the tap a better start. And I've got one of these tapping guide things with a magnetic base. I don't know what you call it, but it's really useful up to about M12. And I love using it when I can. Often you can't, but there's no reason you can't just use a standard tap wrench. And once again, you can just orient yourself with a one, two, three block. You can look down the corner of the one, two, three block and just make sure the tap is kind of going in there straight. And even if you drilled this by hand with a battery drill and you've only got a tap wrench and if your hole is a little bit off, you can often force the tap to go back to 90 degrees within a few degrees just by nudging it as you tap. And this is why you should always have good quality taps because they are quite hard and therefore quite brittle, but the good quality ones resist breaking a whole bunch better. Always use lubricant with the taps. It's not so important when you're using a high speed steel drill to drill through a piece of low carbon steel. Lubrication doesn't really matter for that, but for tapping, it really does. And I use Trefilex for that. It just seems to work really well for the job at hand. And I don't know what secret source they use, but whatever it is, it's quite effective. Got the welder on, I've checked the polarity. The earth clamp is connected to negative and the so-called stinger is connected to positive. So yay, we're good to go. I've done a bit of a check around here and I've made sure that all the flammables are to buggery away. And that includes any oil soaked rags that you're using to stop rust from forming on whatever. They can't be on this surface. No pressure packs, nothing that's gonna see us just in the emergency department for all the wrong reasons, right? So we've got all that together and it is very tempting at this point to start welding the actual job, but I would recommend strongly against doing that and just get 
some piece of scrap or some collection of modern art masterpiece pieces of scrap that you have previously been practicing on and just practice a bit right now because if you haven't struck an arc for the past few days then you might just want to warm up and you might want to get the process right you want to make sure everything's burning just right before you go and botch the job because you've already cut out the bits you've already beveled them you've already cleaned them up like you've put in a fair bit of work it's a bit late in play now to botch the whole thing so we're just going to run a few beads on this scrap and this first weld bead is obviously way too cold i'm having trouble even maintaining an arc in other words the setup is screaming out to me that i need more amps and I already know this, but I'm going through this process with you for a reason. So I dial it up and you can see me grabbing some safety specs here. Never chip a weld without wearing safety specs. Hot slag in the eye, dude. It's the exact opposite of a lazy afternoon in the hot tub with the cheerleaders' mummies. Welding machines are often very optimistic indeed about the actual amps they supply and it's not uncommon to find yourself setting the machine significantly higher than the maximum amps recommended by the rod manufacturer. It's a bit like the fuel economy figures for cars. The numbers and reality generally don't line up. When I actually got around to welding the job, I think it was closer to 150 amps indicated on the welder. The basic process here is you keep dialing it up until it's fusing right in there without burning through the material. That's why it's important to take the time to perfect this process and get the setup right with scrap. If you're welding thin tube or square sections, burning through with a stick welder is common. Then you either need to move a bit quicker or dial back the amps or both. Or switch to MIG which is generally more suited to thinner materials. At least it is for the kind of MIG welders generally used in the home shop. Anyway, after a few iterative dial ups on the amps, I'm finally getting a half decent result on the beads with the scrap and it's essentially time to do the job. The rank amateur mistake here is always not clamping the job in place. Weld metal shrinks when it freezes and clamping it to something solid really helps. Otherwise, every weld you do is going to pull the job out of flat and out of square and then it's dogs and cats living together. Tacking it really helps too. Tacks are these tiny little spots of weld. You've seen people do it, but what they do is they actually work like little clamps with a few hundred kilos of holding power apiece. You absolutely do not need a high-priced full-on welding table just to get started at home. Get yourself a piece of structural scrap like this channel. Your local scrap metal dealer is the place to go for something like that. This bit is reasonably flat on top and it's really easy to clamp to. I'm using a couple of F clamps from Stronghand Tools and a specialty welding square from Fireball Tool. But any general workshop clamps are going to work just fine here. The thing to remember is you've got to lose any plastic pads that they have on the ends because they're just going to melt, dude. And a carpentry speed square is also going to be fine for setting the job up. So it's clamped to a flat surface at 90 degrees and the first welding job is just to put down two tacks deep into the bottom of the bevel joint. Then I'm just chipping the slag away. There's no need to belt the hell out of it. It just generally falls off with minimal persuasion. Then you wire brush it because you want the joint to be slag free for the next weld pass. And then I just flip it over, clamp it down again and confirm that it's still square. Because if it's not at this point, that's recoverable. You just break the tacks, set it all up and go again. But it's not going to be recoverable later, at least not easily. I'm ready to weld here and then my B camera died. Thanks very much. Sorry about that, dude. This is a lot of things to think about at once, like running two cameras and welding. But basically, I just run a full bead on the side opposite the tacks, then I flip the part, 
reclamp it, do a full pass on the tacked side, and then repeat until the valleys are full of freshly minted steel. And you chip and you brush after every bead because you've got to get rid of that slag. I actually got a bit of a slag inclusion on one side of this job, so I had to scratch that out and weld over the top as a repair. 6013 electrodes are notorious for this, but the problem is absolutely on me. I should have been more careful to confirm that I was actually getting good fusion on both sides of the puddle. Anyway, we're not building the Mars Rover or Captain Pete Mitchell's hypersonic dark star here. Uh, we, the side with the slag inclusion got a bit mounded up with weld after I did the repair. So I took it over to the other fat cave off camera because I'm not really set up for filming over there. And I introduced it to the milling machine upliftingly enough. And then I just took the crown off that weld and I brought the whole surface back to about a quarter of a millimetre or so, maybe a little bit more, under the surface of the plate. That's because I decided this would be the face that actually clamps up under there in the table itself. So I wanted that flat so that there wasn't a sort of rocking pivot point there or something that would just jam itself up into the underside of the bench all the time. I wanted that to be flat and reasonably uh, conforming with the surface of the bench from underneath. So while I was there, I got a slot drill like a, a two flute end mill and I relieved this corner just here. I put a radius inside that corner. Now, if you're tempted to do a similar thing yourself, do not do this with a twist drill because that sort of thing with the interrupted cut generally ends badly. You do not need a milling machine to do things of this nature. Absolutely not. You could knock the crown on the weld back with a file and you could file that in as well, just to make it look a little bit more engineered, quote unquote. But you can also see, I don't know if you can see it that well now, but you can see right down into the guts of the weld there, the bevel was here. You can look right down in there from here and you can see that there is actually weld metal all the way down there. Like that's the purpose of the bevels, right? It ensures that the job is full of weld, like all the way through the material, full of fresh weld, even when you grind it flat. Now you can file it flat, you can use an angle grinder to get it flat. The big mistake that a lot of amateurs make is they don't bevel the job, they weld on top. They're using a cheap home welder. It doesn't fuse all the way in, and then they grind most of the strength away and they wonder why it breaks. Incidentally, the other side turned out kind of okay, but I really think a lot of people pay far too much heed to the appearance of welds when, frankly, so many other factors with welding are so much more important than how they look. The thing I am actually pleased about with this job is not the appearance of that weld bead, it's that the part itself turned out flat and square because that's the real battle that you fight whenever you pick up a welder, meaning it's flat enough and square enough to do the job. It's actually about half a millimetre off being dead square over its full length, and it's about as flat as the steel it's made from, like about a quarter of a millimetre when you check it against a precision straight edge. If you're not from around here and you use those units that... Curtis from Cutting Edge Engineering Australia would categorise as bananas, then let me clear that up for you right now, dude, because one of our millimetres is roughly 39 thousandths of one of your bananas. And that means half a millimetre is about 20 thousandths of a banana, and a quarter of a millimetre is about 10 thousandths of a banana. You're welcome. This, of course, means that this thing is square enough and flat enough. And that's a really important ghetto engineering concept, enough, right? Because not just for ghetto engineering and DIY either, it's like for all engineering. Because precision costs time and money and sometimes Going up in precision is orders of magnitude more expensive in terms of the equipment required to achieve it. 
okay? So you've got to match the precision required to the application of the part. And this is a vital concept, actually, in all of engineering that I'm aware of. Unless you're just doing it to please yourself and you're infinitely wealthy, then you can do whatever you want. But in the world of economic rationality, which is kind of every spending decision you make in your fat cave impacts the bottom line, doesn't it? You know, It's got to be enough. It's got to be square enough and flat enough. And frankly, the concept of getting out the surface plate to check this or tramming something in to make sure that we machine it just Goldilocks is flat out absurd. So ghetto flat, ghetto square is a really important concept for all of the things that you will ever make. And it doesn't matter if you're the skunk works or some dude in his garage. So the two parts are welded and ghetto engineering certified as being good enough to hold a vise to a bench. And then I just screw the vise base plate down. I position it Goldilocks on the part and I use a transfer punch to get those remaining two hole locations transferred to the part. One more hit with a center punch on each one of those to help the pilot drill find its home. And then it's a rinse and repeat over at the drill press, followed by two more outings with a 10 millimeter tap. Incidentally, tap sets come in threes usually. There's a taper, intermediate, and a plug tap. The latter two are for blind holes generally. So if you're drilling and tapping a shallow hole like this, all you need to use is the taper tap. As the name implies, it's tapered, which makes it a lot easier to start. Then I just drilled a few random 18 millimeter holes in the parts just to make it look better, to reduce the mass slightly and make it easier to grip when you're carrying it from A to B. And because it's kind of therapeutic to use a mag drill. I've got a full review of the mag drill, by the way, which I will link to above and in the description. This drill is spectacular value for the home shop and it comes with a full set of cutters. Speaking of which, the cutters are called annular cutters, sometimes called rotary brooches. They use a special shank called a weld and shank, and they are properly awesome to use. They're essentially a precision high-speed steel hole saw. They slice through low carbon steel like butter. They do make a lot of Satan's fingernails, however, and they can be razor sharp, and they love getting into your frickin' boots. Pulling this stuff off the cutter with pliers is therefore a good idea, and a magnetic swarf wand makes cleanup a whole lot easier. I deburr the 18mm holes with a zero flute countersink, which is easily the best type of countersink I have ever used for this purpose. Then it's just a matter of drilling corresponding mounting holes in the bench using the vice base as a template. The pro tip for mounting a vise is of course to make sure the fixed jaw, which is the back jaw essentially, you gotta make sure that's at least in line with the edge of the bench so that you can hold long parts vertically without them running into the bench. It makes the vise a whole lot more versatile to use. I'm making it so that I can fit the vise to all four corners of this bench as needed. If you wanted to do essentially the same thing, you could just buy a cheap solid core door and clamp it to two sawhorses and achieve the same thing as a portable work table solution. Having the vise there just makes a lot of operations on location much safer and easier, such as every operation you might conceivably do with an angle grinder. Then I just reassemble the vise with the M10 swivel base clamping screw upgrade. I throw a bit of grease on the lead screw and the swivel base and fit the whole thing up. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. The problem with all DIY, of course, is that this is prototype number one. And if I made prototype number two and then prototype number three, by the time I got to number four and that was the finished product, that'd be pretty slick. But I don't have four times the time and this has been ghetto engineering certified as being good enough to do the job. Like, it'll probably outlast 10 or 20 sacrificial bench tops out on location. And that's kind of important, right? What I want to do, though, is not so much say, hey, dude, you've got to make this, because you don't have to make this. This is just an example. What I want to do is 
if you're receptive to the concept, you should open a window inside your head and realize that there's a whole world of this kind of stuff that can be made at comparatively low cost using comparatively accessible tools that just makes your own workspace more customized and more efficient. And even if you don't achieve that, it just makes you feel good doing shit like this. Like, that's how I see it anyway. So you can do this stuff safely and easily and it doesn't have to break the bank and that's important. Don't forget the links in the description to the Vivor welder, vise and the mag drill. Thanks to Vivor for supporting the DIY content on this channel as well. I greatly appreciate that. And welding, dude, you've got to do it. You have to do it. Welding is the closest a grown man in our society gets to actually being a Jedi. Like flying an Apache helicopter would be a close second to welding. You're controlling a beam of subatomic particles with your mind. And it's just like riding a bike, dude. Only the bike is on fire in hell. And Satan is running you down in his S-Class. And he's got a flamethrower. Who doesn't want that? <laughs>